I'm going to introduce Phil real quickly. Phil is a research fellow in the Adelaide Law School at University of Adelaide, obviously, although she is currently in Tasmania, where she is from. And she also is working under a fellowship with uh, Natural Hazards Research in Australia. And she focuses on um, kind of the legal interactions between climate adaptation, biodiversity conservation, and changing wildfire regimes. So I'm going to turn it over to Philippa. All right, looking forward to it. Thanks. Thank you, Hugh, and thanks, Tara. It's such a treat to be here. What an introduction. Don't tell Zeke. Oh, my word. <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here, and um, I hope that what I have to say is of interest. What I'm going to try and do is not sort of jabber on for too long. I'd love to have a conversation about this. I, I do find that I'm working on an aspect of this challenge um, that is greatly enhanced by access to conversations with scientists and people who care deeply about um, the stuff that law cares about um, but don't necessarily work in the law themselves. So, so let's have a conversation. You've got to get yourself ready for that. That's up to you. Um, I will share my screen and while it's being shared, um, I just want to start by acknowledging the fact that I live and work from um, Muanina country in Lutruita, Tasmania. So I'm located um, right down the very bottom of Australia uh, in Tasmania. And we, um, down here, we live in a landscape that was created, maintained and managed by Aboriginal people since forever. Um, the landscape is managed by fire and it's been, it's been created um, in these kind of um, areas that even now you can see the, 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 um, the work of fire in opening them up. And that's the case in a lot of places around this continent of Australia. And I know that it's the case there too. So we, we share that, we share fire prone landscapes that have been managed using fire well. And I want to honor the traditional owners of the lands that I'm on and that you're on as fire keepers and fire knowledge holders and a really crucial part of the conversation about how we do law better, to do fire better, so that we can aim for something more than just surviving the catastrophic fire regimes that we're starting to experience, but actually learn how to flourish in landscapes that burn. One last little note before I get cracking, and that is that I put the parentheses in the wrong place in the title that I sent to Tara. I said, we're going to imagine and, you know, design coherent adaptation oriented laws about wildfire, but actually a lot of the challenge is in the imagining them, you know, because what we want is not just legal frameworks that effectively allocate liability. We want legal frameworks that help us to work with landscapes and each other so that people, nature, economies, communities can function together and, and become more resilient. And the imagining component of that is really complicated. Um, and hopefully you'll see that in action as I get started. So just a little overview. Um, you are a sophisticated fire audience, so I'm not going to spend a really long time talking to you about how fire regimes are changing and the impacts that they have. But that is, of course, the, the backdrop and the context for the rest of the talk. Touch very briefly on these early fire laws that focused on, on property rights and the complexity of our modern fire laws, and, and perhaps most importantly, their fragmentation across lots of different centres of power and, and topic areas. Um, raise the question, do they need reform? And then very quickly answer it, yes, because I think we're all on, on board with that idea and then um, turn to other legal contexts where we might learn how to design more coherent and adaptation oriented laws. So I think the key messages I want you to come away from this talk with are, our current legal frameworks are complicated and they quite a lot of law that's not about fire has a direct impact on how we govern fire in our landscapes. And so fragmentation is a particular challenge. We need better coherence across our laws. Let's go. Um, just a few kind of facts and statistics about our, our recent fire regimes in southeastern Australia and in California. So we call the 2019-2020 fire season in Australia, it crosses across Christmas, but it actually started in October and went through till June or something insane. It was an extraordinary long period of time. Call that the Black Summer. So we had 33 direct deaths, about 417 smoke-related deaths, which was one of, it's one of the first times they've really tracked that and counted it. That's in Australia. The smoke from those fires traveled all of the way around the world. So there were likely to be other deaths related to smoke um, and that toxic kind of smoke and pollution that created. 
There's an estimate of uh, more than a billion animals, that's vertebrate species, uh, animals killed, 2 billion displaced and more than 23% of the Southeast temperate forests and 70% of the Gondwanan world heritage forests in that Southeast region burned. Um, the forests of Eastern Australia are one of the 15 global biodiversity hotspots. So it was a particularly precious um, area and, and particularly large proportion of it that got burned. So flowing on from that, there is at least one species that's been declared extinct as a result of those fires um, and, and possibly three or four others um, that we don't know about yet. So 15,000 separate fires and they burned well over 24 million hectares. So that's about 59 million acres, which is, I mean, I know that we're not supposed to focus on area burn, but that is just such an enormous area. Um, and, and to compare that, so California's record of breaking 2020 fire season, same 33 deaths, almost 10,000 fires, 10,000 structures lost and 1.4 million hectares burned, um, more than 4% of the state. A smaller area, but with a really, really, really enormous financial price tag. And that I think is one of the big differences is that the, the density of people, California is just so much more than what we see across our Eastern forest and most of our continent actually. So um, California's seven largest wildfires, only one occurred prior to 2020. Black summer was 30% more likely as a result of climate change. And then there's a clear trend. And, and moving to that trend, I spent a little while looking at this graphic, which comes out of the United Nations Environment Program report, spreading like wildfire. And I was like, I think they accidentally put it in twice, same one. But what that demonstrates is that at lo low emission scenarios and high emission scenarios, we see a very similar increase, actually, in the likelihood of catastrophic wildfire events. So even if we aggressively mitigate emissions from climate change, we will nevertheless see a, a continuing increase in our exposure to catastrophic fires. So this work and the thought, the, the thinking that you are each putting into this issue is, is critical, regardless of whether we get good somehow suddenly at mitigating climate change, um, and including if we don't. So um, in terms of biodiversity, and this is kind of my heart space, I did my PhD on climate adaptation for biodiversity and the sort of legal regimes that foster adaptation. And fire is such an important, um, a, a really important threat for biodiversity. Uh, land use change and invasive species are the biggest threats to biodiversity in Australia, but fire is a really close third and it's, it's, gone, it's moving up. So we see that it threatens more than a thousand animal species with extinction. We have a lot of species that have evolved in fire prone areas, but we know that fire naive species and we see that in our sphagnum mosses, like really high alpine mosses and wetlands and ancient, ancient trees like um, our hewan pines and our king billies. Um, when they are exposed to fire, some of them are thousands of years old and they just don't come back. They die. And that's a the kind of these lingering remnants of a previous era that just don't belong in a world that burns like ours does. But we see that even species that are adapted to some level of fire. Um, put in place their fire plans to dig under the ground a little bit, to get into a burrow, to climb a tree. But those fire plans that have worked for them in the past are increasingly in ineffective, are ill-adapted to the kinds of fires we're going to see. So we need laws that actually foster adaptation for biodiversity specifically to fire, but we also need those arrangements that foster human adaptation. So smoke and public health laws are a really huge issue for um, our changing fire regimes and for human health. Um, we see that well beyond the jurisdictions in which the fire occurs, which is a really interesting transboundary negotiated space. Um, structural disadvantage and inequality and inequity justice is a really crucial issue for how we map out these laws. Who gets to have a say in the kinds of laws that we end up with? Um, and land use planning, of course, you guys are all really familiar with the WUI. We call it peri-urban here, um, the edges of our urban spaces um, and the building codes that we need to put in place to make sure that those spaces are protected. It's a cracking paper by Smith and um, colleagues from 2018 about biomimicry, 
but the kinds of strategies that plants and animals use to, um, to survive through a fire and what those kinds of ideas might look like in a building context. And I feel like there's some real opportunities actually for our building codes, our land use plan codes, to look at nature and wonder about how we might replicate some of those strategies in our, um, in our rules and arrangements. Uh, and then sort of on the plus side, so there's huge economics co economic costs to fire, but there's also um, opportunities for markets if they're managed well, to create new opportunities to improve outcomes in relation to fire. And just a little shout out for the Northern Australian Savannah Burning Program, um, which under our emissions reduction um, kind of framework, our law in Australia, that is a little nod to the kind of emission reduction we ought to be doing. Uh, there's a methodology for how um, early season, low intensity savannah burning helps to prevent catastrophic high intensity fires later in the season. Uh, and there's a methodology for calculating the emissions saved and that results in funding for Aboriginal people in Northern Australia to conduct cultural fire, essentially. It's a, it's a funding source for those kinds of fire regimes. Um, and so we need, we need governance frameworks that can clarify and incentivize good forms of burning and other strategies for adaptation. But so what we actually have um, in, in my country and in yours is a whole bunch of laws um, from the colonial, the first kind of colonial laws, which really clamped down on burning. So in Australia um, and in the US, I know First Nations communities used fire to shape and care for country. Country with the capital C in an Australian context is, um, is, is place as a person. It's a familial relationship between a place to which you belong. So that idea of country is deeply wrapped up with culture and it's fostered and cared for through fire. And early colonial laws prohibited unlawful ignitions. And what that usually meant is young people with firecrackers, not allowed to go out there and light stuff, but also Aboriginal people with deep cultural connections and a responsibility and obligation to burn will also be fined and or flogged and or jailed for ignitions. And so we saw a really radical change as a result of that criminalization of fire in, in culture, but also in landscape management and the flammability of landscapes and the buildup of fuel. Colonial laws changed fire regimes and radically affected the well-being of country. But the current laws about wildfire are much more complicated than that. So I went through this process um, towards the end of 2021 in mapping out all of the laws that relate to fire in Australia. So we I, um, I tackled this using the PPRR framework, so an emergency management thing, prevention, preparation, response and recovery. So these are laws that relate some of them to very specific components of that. So they might relate specifically to preparing landscapes for fire or they might relate specifically to response. But you see in the centre there, there's a whole bunch of laws that are right about fire. They set up our fire agencies. They, um, you know, um, create the crime of arson for lighting a fire that causes damage and so on. The next ring out is, is also absolutely critical. It's the um, management of landscapes and land, of native vegetation, of where we live, and, and also that Indigenous land management to the extent that it is supported in law. It, the Indigenous land management stuff actually sits as probably a glaring gap where there's a deep desire and um, at least in, in many cases expertise, but not necessarily a legal space to empower Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia to burn well. But protected area management, so a whole bunch of our parks agencies have a legislative obligation to apply fire for ecological purposes and to manage fires, wildfires that burn in protected areas to protect natural values. Um, and anecdotally, I have observed some real challenging relationships between parks agencies and fire agencies, um, like emergency response agencies about who, whose values matter in a conversation about what we do. Um, there are some places that do that better and, and others that don't. The next sort of legal, the ring out is the legal context. And that's where liability crops up. And I know that's a really big deal in the US. It's not as big a deal here in Australia, but I reckon that's gonna change. The climate law um, component at the moment isn't huge, but like I mentioned, the emission reduction fund and, and regime in Australia that supports savannah burning 
I reckon climate change laws are a space, um, particularly a trading mechanism like here in California, a space where we might do fire better without specifically um, working through those, those um, wildfire regimes. A lot of that is self-explanatory, but there's this big institutional context. And what we see in, um, in inquiries post-fire is we consistently see little individual recommendations. We've got to change this thing. We've got to tweak this thing. We've got to make sure that, that people don't live in this specific area. But there are rules operating on those specific provisions. So our native vegetation laws that say you're not allowed to cut down native veg. Um, there are emergency management implications, there's constitutional implications and litigation rules and funding rules that, that work inwards to restrict what you can reform in an effective way, which, which is really challenging, <laughs> but also good to know because you can start to find consistencies across them. And I started to do some of that work with some colleagues. So, for example, um, with my colleague, Jan McDonald, um, we wrote this paper about responsibility and risk sharing in adaptation and the idea of um, private property rights and native vegetation management, how much responsibility we can give to individual landholders to, to look after their places and protect them from fire and how much in our laws we're just saying we're sharing this responsibility, go forth and solve your own problems without any kind of education or, or power to equip people to do that well. Um, and then we have submitted this paper, which I led with Rebecca Miller um, in California and Jan McDonald again, which, which looks at prescribed burning really specifically. So it takes up this native veg management, cultural fire and liability rules. And we looked at, at law reform to see um, how are these things being connected in the ways that we're designing new laws. Now, this is Australia, but I know for sure that it resonates with the legal frameworks you have in place in the US. Same ideas, like you've got to get a fire permit if you're going to light a fire. Um, you're going to need, in most cases, a smoke permit as well to govern the amount of smoke you're pumping up into your airshed and its consistency with national rules and limits on how much smoke is allowed to be emitted. Um, you're going to be exposed for negligence in lighting a fire that goes off and lights up a forest and creates huge amounts of damage. There's changes to where those liability rules, and we talk about that a little bit later if you want to. Um, but there are land management laws and constitutional implications um, in your jurisdiction too. Equally complicated. So do they need reform? Well, so in Australia, we're massively over inquiried It's outrageous. Every time there's a big fire event, there's a big inquiry set up to work out what went wrong. Uh, and there's some commentators suggesting that's a crazy thing to do because the fact of a fire doesn't necessarily mean that your laws aren't working. It doesn't necessarily mean that people made bad decisions. Fires happen, and sometimes those fires create terrible impacts. It doesn't necessarily mean huge problems. What we do see, though, uh, are a whole host of stakeholders saying we don't even understand necessarily what the laws are, let alone how they operate and how we might, might help to, to make ourselves more resilient. A lot of our frameworks are really old. So, for example, this, the Tasmanian. Thank you. Okay, so so key message here is that we need reform. Um, we've got these gaps, we've got this complexity, and we all need to be pulling in the same direction. We're going to do this well. So just a little um, reference here. So we do need reform. And in fact, California is in the process of undertaking a suite of reforms. And this is a paper very recently published by Rebecca Miller, some of her colleagues. Uh, and it, it goes through the process of working out what um, reforms have been um, put to the legislature over the past 20 years. And um, you'll see in the dark green there, in the most recent kind of legislative sessions that she's looked at, there's a lot, there's a lot of new legislation that's been put up and it covers a host of different issues that relate to fire. Um, and so there is a lot of work being done here, but I think that what I want to suggest is that it's not reform per se that we need, but it's adaptive and it's adaptation oriented reform that's going to be crucial. And the reason why that's crucial is because we know from the latest IPCC work that that the risks that we face are complex, compounding and cascading. So while we might have been, um, you know, preparing for the, the threat of catastrophic wildfire regimes changing, 
those wildfires now sit in a context where they're much more likely than they used to be to be followed by catastrophic flooding. I don't know if you've been following at all what's been happening in Australia, but after the 2019-2020 fire season here, down the east coast of Australia, lots of areas that were burned to completely decimated by the fires were then flooded up to six times by record-breaking floods. And that has washed debris from the fire into river systems and wetlands, causing all kinds of terrible um, consequences there. It's washed away topsoil. It's also prevented the regrowth of um, vegetation that supports animal life. Um, and for a while, and, and then over the course of the last two or three years, it's, it's, we've seen a huge uptick in regrowth so that now we're facing massive increases in fuel loads and a weather system that's likely to increase fire risk again. So, so these risks build on each other and vulnerability that's created by one event is then exacerbated by additional events. There's a risk of maladaptation, path dependency. If you do prescribed fire in particular ways, you might get rid of all of the fire naive species that are perhaps a little bit um, less likely to burn or less likely to be extremely flammable um, and increase the flammability of your landscape overall. Um, and there's some evidence that that might be happening in some of Australia's forest systems that prescribe fire to reduce risks of wildfire, actually increase the flammability of those spaces. So you get kind of a few years of benefit and then a big uptick so that it's even more risky than it was before. We've got hard and soft limits to adaptation becoming evident where um, actually it's too late to adapt and the only opportunity is to transform. And there's a really big question of what if adaptation strategies that we build into legal frameworks fail? And there's um, a report that's been produced by UNAP um, every couple of years about climate adaptation gaps, um, the, the areas where we're not doing enough to adapt. And as I showed you earlier, with the changing fire regimes um, locked in, whether we have low or high emissions, adaptation is essential and the implications are horrendous if we don't do it. Okay, so what do we already know about climate adaptation uh, and law reform from other contexts? And I'm drawing in particular here from my work in um, legal frameworks to foster adaptation for biodiversity, because a lot of work has been done in this, in that space, thinking about how do law, how do laws help us adapt? How do they stop us from adapting? And what do the laws themselves need to look like? And so there's these three kind of key ideas. We need clear goals that acknowledge the inevitability of change. We need strategies that support humans and natural environments to prepare, respond and recover. And the laws themselves must become more adaptable and responsive because we don't want to be creating something that's locked in that 10 years from now is just as problematic as the laws that we find we're dealing with now. We need the laws themselves to be able to adapt. So this is a really great um, policy statement which has been um, decisively ignored by Australian governments, which is quite frustrating, but it was produced by some really excellent people. And they go through these principles for bushfire mitigation and management, including the idea of learning to live with fire um, and the need to ensure that people understand, accept and respect the inevitability of fire in our landscapes. Our fire prevention, preparation, management arrangements are not to exclude fire. They are to manage fire in ways that we can live with. We have um, these principles of individual and shared responsibility with an obligation to make sure that those principles are well understood and appropriately resourced. And to think about fire at landscape scales and integrate learning and knowledge. So that for me, that's that kind of um, statement of principles is a really great place to start a conversation about the goals that we need for our legal frameworks to do fire well, kind of goals that you might implement into legislation and through which you frame the power for emergency agencies to act, the power for um, you know, um, land uses to be governed and so on. So I've done a bit of work looking at the goals and objectives and purposes of laws, fire laws. I put that in inverted commas because it's not just fire specific laws, but also more broadly. There's a couple of examples here. There's only, there's only two pieces of legislation in Australia uh, that are conservation laws that mention fire. And, and that's from a, I mean, I think there's probably about 20, 25 different pieces of legislation around the country that, that govern the way we do conservation. 
And one of them simply mentions that a goal of this Act, the National Parks and Wildlife Act in South Australia, is to prevent and suppress bushfires and other hazards. So there's this kind of um, purpose in the Act that none of that thanks, you know, we won't be having that, which is, as you would know, even better than I do, completely unachievable, but also problematic because that frames obligations like set aside this area, manage its boundaries, protect its natural um, attributes and characteristics. And the other one is the National Parks and Reserves Management Act in Tassie, where I live, and that um, includes a, a suite of objectives which include protecting national parks against and rehabilitating them after adverse impacts like fire and the, their impacts in particular on natural and cultural values and assets within and adjacent to the national park. That for me, that's a much better goal recognising that we want to keep it out when we can. When it comes in, we'll help to rehabilitate it and we'll work with land managers around to make sure the landscape itself is a bit better off. Massive problem with that one, completely not resourced. We talk about parks in this state as being places that are managed for toilets and tracks and not so much for um, natural characteristics. And so fully implemented, that'd be a pretty good step forward, unfortunately. Um, but in our fire-specific laws, the vast majority of the legislation around the country has no principles and goals doesn't state them at all. The Emergencies Act in the Australian Capital Territory, which is where Canberra is located, that's our capital, um, that says that, that one of the goals of the Act to deal with emergencies is to protect and preserve life, property and the environment, which triggers me horribly because that is always the order in which they're dealt with. And so you see, for example, a trade-off between a critically, a, a, the last remaining in population of a critically endangered species and a shed and there's like, mm, what are we going to say? What are we going to say? Why are you asking that question? Save the species. Oh, my word. There's an extraordinary balancing process that almost never is decided in the favour of biodiversity, which is a huge challenge. But then in the Rural Fires Act in New South Wales, which is the state in which Sydney is located with cool beaches like Bondi, and it's probably the part of Australia that you think the whole of Australia is like, and it isn't. It's New South Wales. But they have this provision, which is for the protection of infrastructure and environmental, economic, cultural, agricultural community assets from damage arising from fires. And so you see there that the environmental assets, which is an interesting way to think about the environment just in general, is listed there in, in the context of a bunch of other things that we like. Um, and we don't see in the rest of that legislation a process of kind of mapping out, well, well how do we balance them in a response scenario? How do we ensure? in terms of our preparation, that all of those things are accounted for. And without goals and objects, all you get is a provision that says there will be a, you know, there will be a fire agency, they will be funded in this way, they will go out and create plans. We don't have a goal that we're all pulling towards, and that's a really critical oversight from my perspective. Now, in the biodiversity context, this really great project, actually, led by Mike Dunlop at the CSIRO, which is our kind of science agency at the national scale, did this Climate Ready Conservation Objectives project. And after surveying all of these different objectives, all these different laws and policies and, and management plans might incorporate, the research team came up with this goal of managing change to minimise loss, which I think might be a really interesting way to think about landscape scale management in the context of fire for a host of different values, but to, to be able to balance them even as they change is a really important starting point. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Um, now I'm coming, I'm coming close to time, but what I wanted to do is, is we've got the goals and, and how we sort of think about our law as a really important starting point. But the strategies that we put in place in, in legislation, it might say, for example, what that means, that goal or object to foster environmental and protect environmental assets. We do that by, and then laws create power for public decision makers in particular to act. And it's the case that if, if a public decision maker isn't given a power of some kind to act, they can't act, which is the opposite, of course, for ordinary people where you can do anything you like as long as it doesn't breach a law. Um, laws give power to public decision makers to act in particular ways and the powers they should give are powers to foster adaptation. And so um, this is a really interesting um, paper reporting on a project pulling together a bunch of adaptation strategies and kind of a menu for adaptation. And some of the suggestions set out in a table in that paper 
um, include these kinds of strategies. And I was reading through and I was like, like they sound really good, but then um, there's this there's this challenge of dealing with fire as we do in our laws in in the specific context of fire and emergencies or, or you know, forest management um, and parks management in Australia is sometimes the case as well. But then we have this other body of law that's environmental law and land use planning, and they don't really talk. And so, for example, for me, that first strategy there to sustain fire as a fundamental ecological process um, I wonder whether fire, a, a burn, a, an, um, a purposeful application of fire for an ecological purpose might be considered a taking under the, the um, Federal Endangered Species Act or the Californian conservation legislation. If you burn habitat accidentally or perhaps even on purpose, is that taking? And are there implications under conservation laws for that? And is restoring fire as an ecological process consistent with species recovery plans? which are statutory plans that can be enforced. And sometimes they were written a really long time ago and don't incorporate fire. And just briefly as one example of that, we have OBPs, a little migratory parrot, an orange-bellied parrot that, that um, spends half the year down at the very, very bottom of Australia. And then it migrates across the strait to Victoria, the state of Victoria. And for the longest, they're critically endangered. They got down to like six breeding pairs at one stage and they, they were doing the managers were doing everything they could to just maintain the landscape like keep fire out keep disturbance out never go there all these kinds of things and then a huge fire came through the area and the numbers were starting to get up and the scientists terrified turns out their preferred foraging habitat is about three to five years post burn so there's this boom in food and the population was like increasing dramatically really quickly and so the, actually the reintroduction of fire was excluded or um, non-preferred management tool in the management plan for the recovery of the species, but turns out to have been a really positive thing. There's a lot of uncertainty sitting there behind it too. And then just as another example, so with this strategy number six, identify, promote and conserve fire and climate change adapted species and genotypes. Well, what I would ask are the best adapted species, are they native? because those species, of course, are protected or at least tolerated in the landscape. But if the best, if the best, most successful species in a landscape are weeds, which is typically the case, um, they may well be managed as invasive species and promoting them may be directly contradicting a management or even a, an eradication plan that can be a legal instrument too. Uh, introduction, introducing sorry, climate adapted species may also be completely inconsistent with First Nations laws and customs or it might be consistent with them. And so there's a, there's a conversation and a um, prioritization process that needs to be undertaken there. And of course, one of the big adaptation strategies is beneficial fire. So it's, it's this purposeful application of fire for cultural, ecological, um, or risk hazard management um, purposes. I just had a little bit of a play connecting up adaptation principles, which are in blue there. So equity, co-benefits, transparency, and so on with aspects of beneficial fire and then the kinds of legal instruments that we might use to achieve those and I don't know about you but in Australia those those instruments are typically absent or poorly targeted at reintroducing fire so we have very little in the way of um, specific laws to foster First Nations fire planning and fire sovereignty burn bosses is not a thing here so we don't have people who are trained up to lead fire programs or sign off on, on plan, um, fire management um, plans. Um, but we do have Indigenous rangers who manage protected areas. They're funded under Commonwealth or, or federal funding um, and they work under management plans. Maybe there's an opportunity for Indigenous-led fire to promote equity and co-benefits through the ranger program. And, and the other one I just mentioned briefly is the fire shed idea. That's not included at all in any of Australia's laws, but we do have catchment scale legislation. So for managing water catchments, because water is a huge challenge in Australia, it's a very dry continent. And they are typically intended to be bioregional. So the governance sort of lines are supposed to be allocated according to bioregion. They would be fantastic, not just for fire sheds, but also for air sheds to deal with smoke, which is not a way we allocate responsibility at the moment. Um, and that could foster multi-tenure planning and action for fire hazard reduction, but also for recovery actions that are adaptive in nature. 
So there's some cool sort of connections and opportunities there, I think. And then just briefly, this final one, which is about becoming the, these legal frameworks, becoming themselves more adaptable and responsive. There's a really big body of scholarship about the adaptability of laws. And it includes all of these kinds of ideas about flexibility and reflexivity and, um, and conflict resolution and adaptive management. Participatory capacity. I'm not sure if any of the people on the call are actually um, engaged by a fire agency, but um, one of the really huge challenges that we see in Australia at least, and I suspect there too, everywhere probably, is that emergency management is um, involves so many kind of last minute decisions, do you know, like you're standing in an incident management centre or control room and making a decision really quickly about what to save and how to act. Um, you don't have opportunities to like draw on diverse perspectives in that context. All of that work has to be done well before a fire starts. But emergency authorities are not necessarily equipped with the power to go out and seek those perspectives nor with the expertise to balance the different values that might be represented in the, the perspectives that they receive. So there are, there are sort of um, this fragmentation of responsibility um, and power under law that entrenches some of the challenges that we see in adapting. But the big one for law is about flexibility because actually legal frameworks are designed to promote certainty and predictability in decision making to govern relationships in predictable ways. And so flexibility is very hard. But what we do have are some, some clear kind of mechanisms and tools that do help to do that in manageable ways. And so, for example, you might um, build in an obligation in legislation to revisit a plan every five years. You might include a principle in your legislation that says, when you write a plan, you must refer to the best available or most recent um, science about the climate impacts on fire. So it doesn't say you have to have a plan that says this. It says when you make a plan, you have to take into account the information that will help you to adapt, write your plan using that information, and then check and see if it was a good plan. And if it wasn't a good plan, change it. Do it differently next time. And so these, these um, obligations, these procedural obligations, can build adaptability into the things we do and can mandate them and be enforceable without saying this is what it's going to look like at the end because that is not very flexible. So that's my talk and I hope that it's given you some, some food for thought. I'm really sorry about dropping off in the middle there, um, but hopefully we have some, some questions and an opportunity for a conversation.